Good afternoon, members. Uh, good afternoon, officers, members of the public. A very warm welcome to the planning committee. Um, as organised as ever, um, turning to the agenda. Um, firstly, may I welcome? There's a there's a new member sitting opposite. First time to the planning committee. I got told off the last time I didn't welcome somebody who was new, and it resonates with me uh, greatly. So, Councillor Tippett, welcome. Very warm welcome. Apologies of the seating arrangements and who you must sit beside, um, but nevertheless, we, we'll work on that. Um, but very warm welcome to the planning committee. I believe you were subbing for Councillor Tuffin. It's, it's not a hologram. You are here. We are delighted that you're here. Um, Right, okay. I'll, I'll leave you to deal with that. Um, okay, but um, uh, if we can just deal with any apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We have apologies from Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Mrs. Pengeli is substituting. Apologies from Councillor Allen. Councillor Tippett is substituting. And apologies from Councillor Finn. Thank you very much. Um, Declarations of interest. Ha have you received all the forms in respect of declarations of interest? Thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest for members? Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, all members indicating no declarations. Um, item number three, uh, minutes. Um, if uh, committee members, um, I'm sure you've had time to review the minutes. Are there any issues arising? No issues. I'll sign those minutes at the end of this meeting. Thank you very much. Um, item number four, Chair's urgent business. I've not been provided of any urgent business uh, leading up to the meeting, um, so we'll trot over that one. Uh, item number five, questions for members of the public. Again, I've not been provided with any questions. Thank you very much. That brings us swiftly and neatly on to agenda item 6.1. Um, Excuse me a moment. Members, just pause for a moment. I just need to check something with the officers. Thank you, members. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, dealing with the one item we have today, Eero Business Retail Park on Plymouth Road in Plymouth. Um, and Jess, I think you're taking us through that application. Many thanks. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm, yeah, so I'm Jess Gavon, and I'm here to present to you uh, the application on Eero Retail Park, um, reference 21 forward slash uh, 02266FUL. Um, this application is for Aero Retail Park and just to the south of Plymouth Road in the ward of Clinton Earl, um, as you can see on the map. Oh, lovely. Apologies. Um, as you can see on the map, um, Plymouth Road is also um, the boundary um, for the ward of Plimpton St. Mary. Um, so although the site is technically in the Plimpton Earl ward, um, the residential um, you can see in this photo is actually uh, within Plimpton St. Mary. Um, the site is approximately uh, 2.4 hectares of land and rectangular in shape. It currently contains three retail units and the proposal in front of members is to demolish um, the middle unit. Um, is to demolish the middle unit, to change the use of the unit to the east um, from retail to BH Sui Generous, a builder's merchant, and to reconfigure the western unit um, with part demolition and um, part extension, and to retain this for retail use, um, specifically uh, Class EA um, to be occupied uh, by home bargains and also limited on what goods it can sell and um, by condition. 
Um, the site has historically been retail and has been since the units were given permission in the 80s. Um, since then, there's been quite an extensive planning history on the site, as detailed in section four of the officer report. Um, this has included the installation of mezzanine floors, and in 2010, it was confirmed um, through a lawful development certificate um, that all three units can be used for open use retail. Um, in 2013, Morrisons was given permission to build on the site, um, which never materialised, and local needs for shopping are now being met elsewhere, such as on the adjacent Lidl and Aldi on Galileo Close. There is a fallback position um, where if this application is refused, the owner is able, in theory, to use the existing buildings on the site in accordance with the current permitted development rights and permitted development. Uh, not the Morrisons, as that has expired, um, but the lawful development certificate and does state that there is no current restriction um, on the sale of goods across the three units. The reason this application is in front of members today is that the site is currently allocated for 60 houses in the local development plan, the Plymouth and Southwest Devon Joint Local Plan, which was adopted in 2019 and referenced PLY 60.8, and the application in front of you is recommended for approval. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through in more detail what is proposed for the site, and then I'll sum up, sum up the reasons as to why officers are re recommending um, this application for approval. Uh, just as a bit of background, um, this application was made valid on the 1st of February 2022. Um, there was a pre-application on the site where it was flagged to the applicant that this is a deviation from the plan, but through the application process, the negotiation which has taken place and the additional information which has been provided on the site, overall, whilst it is a finely balanced decision, officers are of the view that there have been significant changes in context um, since the joint local plan was adopted, most notably in relation to the climate emergency declaration and the economic context. And this does support the argument um, for an earlier development of the site um, rather than waiting for a future housing scheme. Um, so this is the site. Um, as mentioned, it just sits to the south of Plymouth Road, which is where the main entrance to the site is. Um, off to the west is the little store, given permission in 2015. Um, to the south of the site, um, uh, it, the site is bound by an existing railway line, um, beyond which is an industrial estate, which includes a number of commercial and industrial units. Um, to the east, um, just off the plan here, um, you have Underwood Recreational Ground and Residential Beyond. And in addition to the retail park itself, um, the application site um, comprises sections of the landscape banks um, either side of the Tory Brook to the north. Um, these are densely, densely wooded, um, which serves to filter and screen large parts of the retail park when viewed from the north. Um, and you won't be able to see this from the plan, um, but there is a change in levels here um, from Plymouth Road um, to the site. Um, but hopefully some of the photos I've taken and we'll show later on in the presentation um, will show this. Um, this is a more uh, detailed plan of the site as existing, um, showing um, the three units as current. Um, two of the units have been vacant for a number of years and last operated as a cooperative homemaker, Unit B, that's the middle unit, and Unit C, um, the uh, unit on the east. Uh, the remaining unit, um, Unit A, so the western unit, has recently been made vacant by Biology, which was a discount retailer. Uh, the total floor space within these buildings is 6,319 square metres and the buildings are surrounded by hard standing vehicle parking and service areas with trees dotted through the car park. Um, and as you'll see from the upcoming photos, um, all of these units are significantly damaged and present a poor um, image to local residents and those accessing the site. Uh, this is the proposed plan. It looks quite small on there, so hopefully um, you'll have seen it um, previously. Um, but So what you can see here um, is what is proposed. Um, so the demolition of the middle unit, Unit B, has disappeared. Um, the change of use of Unit C, so that unit on the right-hand side, um, from retail to uh, BH Sui Generous to be operated as a builder's merchant. And then Unit A on the left, which is going to be remodelled. It includes um, part demolition of 1,242 square metres of floor space to the west of the unit, um, so the left-hand side, and part extension of 1,307 square metres um, to the east. 
Um, this results in an overall change of floor space in minus 205 square meters, so the unit in total is uh, reducing slightly. Um, so in total, the site um, will be losing um, 2,086 square meters of retail floor space, um, and also um, solar panels are going to be installed on the roof of Unit A as well. Uh, the main entrance to the site uh, will remain from Plymouth Road, um, but because of that steep gradient to the site, um, grounding does take place, and so the right turn lane is to be extended, which is covered by a condition. Um, parking, uh, the site is currently proposed in 177 car parking spaces, um, with 20 oversized for disabled and um, parent-child parking, and a condition is added um, uh, for the applicant to submit more details on the cycle parking provision and also EV charging. Um, there's also a condition asking for further details for the builders' merchants to, um, as additional space uh, may be required due to the nature of the vehicles which will visit the site. Um, pedestrian crossings, uh, there's to proposed to be three. I'm going to try and do the point in. Um. No, I don't think it's working. Um, but there's three pedestrian um, uh, 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 proposal, uh, crossings proposed, and um, they kind of, as you um, enter the site, they would be on the right and across, and then which is one in, t in front of the unit. Um, for landscaping, um, there's to be 185 uh, linear meters of new uh, native hedgerow planting, uh, primarily across the south of the site, and eight, 800 meters of squared wildflower uh, grass verges. Um, with regards to trees, uh, the redevelopment proposes to require the removal of 19 trees from the car parking area to facilitate the development. Um, these trees are under a TPO, and the reason they were put under a TPO um, was to provide a good visual amenity to what is otherwise a sea of tarmac. Um, through negotiation, um, the applicant has agreed to provide an additional 11 new trees in the car park um, within silver cell tree pits, um, meaning that in total, 49 new trees are going to be planted, um, which is an uplift of 30 trees over and above what is already there. Um, and the trees to the north, um, which um, I'll provide more details in the landscaping plans, uh, provide the screening are all to be retained and to remain under the TPO. So this is the site as currently viewed um, from Lidl's car park looking east. So this is the old biology building. You've then got, um, this is to the north of the site, so this is walking along the north elevation of Unit A, and um, so you can see an example here of the vegetation and the screening which is to be retained. Um, this is coming from the end of that corridor, um, where you can see uh, Unit B to the right, which is the middle unit to be demolished, um, and Unit C, which is to become the builder's merchant. This is at the back of um, Unit C, um, B8 Sui Generous, so we've walked the length of the site um, from west to east. This is to the entrance to the site off Plymouth Road. The entrance is just to the left here, um, and this photo was taken uh, looking west. And then this is the entrance to the site uh, looking, looking east, um, entrance to the right, and hopefully this is kind of showing um, the change in levels that I was trying to talk about earlier, which you may not be able to see um, from a proposed plan. And then this is the entrance as current, uh, currently as you see it. So looking into the min middle unit, the unit B, which is to be demolished. So this is the detailed land landscaping plan for unit A. Um, so you, you most probably won't be able to see these, um, but there's red dots, which are showing um, the 19 trees which are to be removed. Um, the bright green, green blobs at, at the top are showing um, the existing trees which are to be retained. And then the darker green circles um, dotted through the car park and uh, to the south of the site um, are where the new 49 trees are gonna go. The brown line to the south is showing where the 185 linear metre of new native hedgerow in is going to, planting is going to be taking place, and the light neon green um, shows where the wildflower grass verges are going to go. Um, also, just in terms of fencing, um, the pink line around the garden centre um, indicates um, new fencing for security. And then through the negotiation, um, the fencing around the builder's merchant has been lowered um, to 2,400 millimetres, um, so it won't be imposing for those driving into the site. 
And again, you can see the trees which are to be retained, um, which will help screen the site from local residents and the rest of the new trees which are to be uh, planted in the car park. Um, with regards to biodiversity, um, overall, all this application is well exceeding the policy requirement for 10%. Um, with the new hedgerows, wildflower planting, etc., and the additional trees, we are looking at about 90% uh, biodiversity net gain. Um, just in terms of what proposed the, the buildings are going to look like, um, they're going to be stripped back. Uh, the proposed external envelope is a simple portal frame with an external red brick at low level, grey cladding above, and a small parapet, so a continuation of the cladding will hide the gutter and roof composite sheet. And the same with uh, Unit C. Um, with regards to Unit C, there is a condition on this um, for the applicant to submit further operation intention of the site, as at the moment there is no confirmed occupier. However, officers are satisfied that the information we have received, such as the submitted drawings, which illustrate the proposed entrances and external evaluations, is enough to de determine the application as is. And there's also a condition um, on the application for them to submit um, examples of the materials as well to ensure durability and quality. This is a visual um, provided by the agent showing what the site will look like. Uh, you can see the trees in the car park and um, pedestrian routes and with what the home bargains could look like. And then this again just shows the proposed plan. And I'm just going to uh, quickly cut, summarize some of the key issues um, officers have gone through and negotiated with the applicant on the in principle use of this site and its continuation um, as retail rather than housing. Um, so the key matter um, is that of the principle of the development. So planning law requires that applications must be determined in accordance with the development plan, which is the joint local plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. This is a balancing act, and given that the J JLP is considered to be an up-to-date plan, um, this is a high hurdle to overcome. An assessment of these material considerations and the weight that officers uh, recommend is given um, to these considerations is set out in the report, um, pages 11 to 15, I believe, in the copy you have. Um, and I don't propose to go through, through these in detail here, but I would be happy to address any questions later. Um, but for now, I simply want to draw uh, members' attention um, to the overall conclusion on page 15, um, namely that although the view of officers is that no single other material consideration is significant to outweigh the joint local plan policy allocation, taken together, officers believe that there is overriding benefit in allowing the proposal. Of particular note is the significant worsening of economic conditions since the joint local plan was adopted, resulting from COVID and current, current inflationary pressures, and the low carbon credentials of the development in light of the climate emergency declaration. The economic benefits are listed in the report, um, including 190 full-time equivalent construction jobs and 145 full-time and part-time jobs. And early investment in this site would also bring regeneration benefits to a site which otherwise might continue um, to lay empty and deteriorate whilst waiting for a future housing development to come forward. With regard to climate emergency, in addition to the benefits of retrofitting rather than demolishing an existing build building, the applicant has gone further than joint local plan policy requirements in its solar panel provision, for example, on Unit A, and also gone above and beyond in terms of the biodiversity net gain. Um, if this application is approved, um, then clearly we would lose a housing site uh, to the overall future supply in the city, but it's not considered to be currently needed as part of the five-year housing land supply and a local plan review in the future will be the appropriate ve vehicle to review future housing need and identify new sites. With regards to retail, um, the council sought advice from Avison Young, who the council have used in the past for the joint local plan itself and for other applications such as the Dereford District Centre. For retail, there's three key policy considerations, which are the sequential test, um, so whether there are more appropriate sites and um, that the home bargains could go on in the catchment area, the impact of the site on existing centres and the overall retail strategy of the joint local plan. Officers are satisfied that with the additional information which has been provided by the applicant, and um, these tests have been met, an extended sequential test and impact assessment were submitted, and overall the site is reducing the amount of retail and um, floor space by um, 2,086 square metres. It draws a line under the open retail nature of the sites, as currently the site can operate with all three units as retail. 
and, and through the test, the applicant has proved the impact of what is proposed would be limited and that there are no other preferable sites within the catchment area. So because of this, and the fact that the applicant has agreed and put forward a condition limiting what can and can't be sold from Unit A to reflect the end use, um, it's not considered that this application will undermine the retail strategy of the Joint Local Plan and the network of centres across the city. So that's it. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. And I also have Jonathan Bell here, who I may call on um, to support any particular policy questions I may not be able to answer. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm sure we'll come back to you in due course in respect to questions. I believe we have a speaker in respect of this uh, application. Mr. Fox, as the agent, would you like to come down to the front row beside the um, planning officer, please? Good afternoon, Ms. Fox. Mr. Fox, you've got five minutes to speak to the planning committee. Would you like a one minute uh, reminder? In uh, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the floor is yours, Mr. Fox. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Planning Committee. My name is Adrian Fox. I'm the agent acting on behalf of the applicant, TJ Morris, the parent company of Home Bargains. We work closely and collaboratively with officers at the Council in the consideration of the planning application before you this afternoon, and we fully endorse the officer's recommendation to grant plan permission to enable the refurbishment and improvement of Errol Retail Park. The application site comprises a prominent brownfield site that is currently in a poor state of repair and is entirely vacant. Indeed, the dangerous state of existing buildings has been highlighted as a concern to the applicant by the local ward councillor. The proposals before you provide the opportunity to address these concerns and enhance the site, both in terms of its offer and appearance. The proposals seek the retention and extension of Unit A to enable this to be occupied by the national retailer Home Bargains, a leading discount retailer not currently represented in Plymouth together with the change of use of Unit C so that this can be occupied by a builder's merchant. The remaining building, Unit B, will be demolished. In planning policy terms, all relevant matters have been fully addressed and satisfied. In terms of the principle, the relevant retail tests have been addressed and satisfied, as confirmed by the independent retail advice that has been provided to the Council. It is agreed by all parties that no alternative site exists that is available and suitable to accommodate the proposed development and that the proposals will not lead to a significant adverse retail impact. Indeed, the site already comprises an established retail destination and the proposals will result in an overall reduction of unrestricted retail floor space in this location of approximately 3,500 square metres. Likewise, whilst the application site is allocated for housing, robust evidence has been presented that demonstrates a residential scheme in this location would simply not be viable. The position has been recognised by the Council Development Viability Officer and reflective of no residential scheme coming forward since being allocated for housing in March 2019. In contrast, the application proposals before you this afternoon are deliverable, with an owner developing TJ Morris willing and ready to commence works. This is important given that the site is entirely vacant in a poor state of repair and making no positive economic or social contribution to the local area. Should the planning application be refused in the absence of a viable residential any alternative scheme, there is danger that the site will remain vacant and further deteriorate. Critically, the applicant's purchase of the site will only be completed should planning permission be granted. To conclude, we would highlight the following. There is no viable alternative to the application proposals. It has been agreed that the proposals satisfy relevant retail planning policy. All other planning issues have been addressed and no concern has been raised. There are significant benefits associated with the development proposals that are material considerations of substantial weight in the determination of proposals. These include securing the long-term occupancy and improvement of a prominent brownfield site that is vacant, suffering from vandalism and trespassing, and making no, no positive economic contribution. The creation of approximately 335 jobs through the operative and construction phases, the generation of approximately £2.2 .2 million per year in gross value added linked to this employment, increased business rate revenue, a proportion of which can be retained by the local authority, improved consumer choice for the benefit of residents, improved landscaping and including the planting of substantial new trees, delivery of a biodiversity net gain and the site alongside improved sustainability credentials of the existing building. 
These benefits are significant, particularly in the absence of an alternative viable scheme for the site. Thank you for your time this afternoon, and I hope that you can support your officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fox. If you'd like to return to your seat, thank you. Um, just in the interest of transparency, it should be noted that a site visit was conducted, as referred to by the officer, um, in yesterday. Present was myself, Councillor Nicholson, Councillor Tippett, uh, Councillor Stoneman, uh, Ms. Francis, and the officer, Ms. Vaughan. Um, we all um, went through the plan at the site. Oh, and Ms. Councillor Watkins, forgive me, uh, was also present. Um, so, members, over to you. Um, please show hands who would like to raise. I have Councillor Stoneman, and I'll make notes as I go around. Thank you, Councillor Stoneman. Thank you, Chair. Um, this scheme is looking, very, is looking very good, but one concern that I do have is, obviously, this has been allocated in the Joint Local Plan for Housing, um, and it's quite a significant site, um, and the future housing needs of the city could change. Um, so I'm concerned about, you know, uh, having a regeneration of the site for retail and then the, the possibility of this uh, site being used for housing be, be gone. So I'm wondering if, uh, I suppose this question is more appropriate for Jonathan really, what, um, sorry, not what, how many um, dwellings or uh, properties has this been site allocated for in the joint local plan and how, uh, where would we have to then find land elsewhere to build these for the housing need going forward? Uh, thank you, Councillor Stoneman. Um, I will um, start and I may call on um, Jonathan um, just to see if there's anything additional to add. Um, so the, house, the site has been allocated for 60 houses in the joint local plan, um, so the reference is POY 60.8. Um, um, at the moment, um, what we're finding is that there is a healthy five-year housing land supply. Um, so given that this is a, um, a, a, a challenging site um, to deliver um, because of its planning history and its location, um, the site isn't due to come forward um, for housing until 2030-31 um, to kind of compensate that. Um, this is a is a loss and um, the housing will need to be allocated somewhere else um, but that will be needs to be dealt with um, at the local plan review and um, which is the appropriate appropriate vehicle and um, to review um, future housing needs um, and identify new sites. Uh, Jonathan do you have anything to add? Uh, thank you yeah I, I, all I would add is that the city currently has a, a 5.8 years housing land supply so we we are in a surplus position at the moment so losing a site and this site was as uh, jess said due to come forward later in the plan period but overall in terms of housing supply albeit it would be unfortunate the loss of 60 is not crucial to the ability to meet the city's future housing needs in our assessment Councillor Stoneman, um, do you have any more questions in respect of that aspect? Are you content with that response? Thank you. I have Councillor Stevens. Thanks. Um, I think losses of housing plots uh, is, is, is worrying, and uh, we need to be extremely careful and examine this, uh, this closely. If it's such a challenging site, why was it allocated in a local plan that was drawn up so recently? for housing. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Um, yeah, so this was, um, so one of the reasons um, why uh, it was allocated as housing um, was, was to do with the open retail use of the site and actually that actually should there be an additional, a different use on the site. And what is potentially happening is um, a retail creep across the corridor along Plymouth Road um, where retail is kind of slowly going there. And one of the reasons it was allocated was to pot potentially um, halt there to try and uh, create um, an attractive space um, for housing. Um, so that's one of the reasons um, why it was allocated. Um, it was acknowledged, so the retail planning history of the site was known to, obviously, to the uh, um, authority when it was first allocated. Um, and that's why it's kind of being put, pushed back into the trajectory. Um, but 
I think it was more to do with the fact to try to change the um, look of the area and also as well to stop that um, the applicate the site of, as current and um, the three units could just be um, open retail use um, for anything at the moment um, so it was a potential to control that as well uh, Jonathan do you have anything to add yeah, I mean, it, I think one of the things we're finding with housing um, the delivery in the city from a local plan perspective is a lot of the easier to develop sites have been taken. And the longer we go through the plan period, it, we get to the sort of more tricky ones. And this does fall into the category of more tricky. I mean, there's obviously the local plan is seeking a lot of housing in the city centre and other brownfield sites as well. And so we are forced really to look at some difficult brownfield sites in terms of a delivery perspective. However, this was allocated for the reasons uh, Jess said as a very positive planning reason to try and change the nature and character of this part of, the, of Plimpton. And it was also looked at in terms of its assessment, in terms of how easy it is to access um, some local facilities, very good access to public transport, very close to primary schools. Um, close to a local convenience store. So from a broader sustainability perspective, it was ticking quite a lot of boxes. So that's why it was allocated and, and supported by the planning inspector. But the reason why it was put later into the plan period, it was because we actually realised that it wouldn't be straightforward and it wouldn't take a bit of work and a bit of process to get through to the point where it would actually come forward. Thanks. I, I appreciate what you say about timescales. But does the local plan, joint local plan, have a, to, to follow on your phrase, does it have a hierarchy of trickiness of sites? Does the local plan itself say this was tricky, difficult, awkward, whatever phrase we want to put on it? Well, it, it kind of does, really, because the five-year housing land supply has to identify those sites that are considered to be uh, deliverable within that five-year period and available within that five-year period and viable in that five-year period. So, um, so inevitably, the, the sites that, that are, are profiled to come forward earlier are the ones that are going to be the ones that we can deliver, because without the f achieving the five-year land supply, we end up in quite a tricky position as a local authority, and we can find um, that planning uh, is delivered by appeal rather than by you know, the plan guiding planning. So, uh, yes, so some of the harder to, to deliver sites are certainly towards the end of the plan period, and they are ones that, that therefore we know we've got to work out to make sure they come forward as viable propositions. Well, it might be that this one is one we have to work out a bit, in my view, and to dismiss it this early on seems to be very, very negative and uh, not put much faith in the deliverability of the local plan, which I think cross-party we all we all signed up to um, in terms of the net zero approach can can you give us a, 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 a this will be my last point for now chair I, I assure you could we have some sort of assessment of car and lorry journeys based on what's proposed versus a developed housing uh, 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 site with the numbers that the local plan currently outlines, because I would have thought that the average car journey per house, if it were developed for domestic dwellings, would be a lot less than all the shoppers and delivery lorries that would come along a very, very busy road. So I would have, I would have thought at face value, net zero would lead us, net zero considerations would lead us towards uh, domestic dwellings rather than a big. Uh, retail stroke industrial site uh, as described. Um, thank you, Councillor Stevens. Um, so I don't have um, the numbers of a potential housing site on, on me that would need to um, uh, be looked at. Um, but if I draw your attention to paragraph 129 of the um, report, um, it does say that because um, of the, op the current open retail uh, um, use for the site, um, the actual application and um, would potentially um, decrease the amount of traffic that could potentially come in if it was 
um, kept as it is and used as retail. Um, so uh, result in um, 352, uh, 627 and 566 um, two-way vehicle trips in the weekday, a.m., p.m. and Saturday, Saturday and peak periods respectively. Um, but apologies, I don't have the comparison to what a housing site uh, would be. Uh, 60 homes, two cars per house. That's great for now. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to make a couple of points. I suppose it's, I, I completely understand where Councillor Stevens is coming from in terms of the departure from the plan and the loss of houses. I think it's worth remembering, though, that a previous planning committee, we were looking at a site that was allocated that then ended up, we were, we were making, we were giving permission for, for more houses than had been allocated. So I think it's worth just putting that on record that sometimes we get asked to, to look at things in both directions. I'm not making a judgment on that. I'm just reminding us that we did have to do that last year. Um, the points I want to refer to, I'm sort of taking it on a little bit and thinking, okay, if we were to accept the proposals, what's in front of us at the moment, I'm not convinced is as concrete as I'd like to see it, particularly around the sustainability aspect. So I've got um, two questions. The first one is around the um, condition 13 and provision for solar on the top of unit A. My question is why are we not conditioning solar on the top of unit B? And then my second question is about condition eight where we look for further information about the number of electric vehicle charging points given the direction of travel that the department's going in and that this committee's been going in i personally would rather see a stronger condition where we're actually stipulating closer to a number of what we're expecting rather than leaving that up for negotiation outside of this committee um, we've looked at other sites across the city where we're being quite tight on what we're expecting them to deliver and I think that is a bit of a departure from where we've been heading so why not solar on unit B and is there scope to beef up condition 8 and I realise that might need to be something that we propose but I'd just like to hear your comments on why it's as it is at the moment please. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, with regards to um, why um, solar panels haven't been um, required uh, for unit uh, B or C. Um, so the solar panels on unit A is um, in addition. So the applica application without the solar panels is already um, going above and beyond and um, the sustainability measures as um, required um, by Dev 32. Um, so uh, we were quite um, happy to accept that unit A potentially would have the solar panels and not request it from the um, applicant um, with regards uh, to the builder's merchant. Um, with regards um, to the EV charging, um, so we haven't received any details from the applicant regarding that at the moment, which is why it's being conditioned. Um, but anything um, would need to kind of uh, uh, be in requirement with our supplementary planning document and the standards which should be put in there, and um, we wouldn't be accepting less. Um, I don't think our transport colleagues um, would allow us, and uh, the um, the. Uh, condition is a pre um, pre commencement condition as well, um, so we would need that detail and um, to be approved um, prior to any development um, taking place. Great, thanks. So just to clarify, I've understood that correctly. You're basically saying that within that written condition implies a minimum of what the SPD is requiring, um, and not less than that. So we can sort of trust you to make sure that that is adhered to. So whatever is submitted by the applicant in terms of the evidence they do to discharge that condition, it would be measured against the guidance which is currently in the supplementary planning document um, for EV charging. Um, so yes, I can assure you that, yes. Um, just, just to push that a little bit further, just to again make sure I understand. Is there scope that the wider fact that this development at the moment is above the the net biodiversity requirement might see a reduction in the number of EV points. And, and are we therefore going to you know, say, well, actually, yes, you've done quite a lot, so we're not expecting as many? Because quite frankly, this is a big retail unit, and it's in a residential area, and we want to future-proof the site. If we'd been putting housing there, we would have been stipulating quite a substantial number of EV charging points. I'm not keen that the net biodiversity gain 
sees the applicant wriggle out, for want of a better phrase, I'm sure with all good faith, of providing EV. So what, what it might be between the two of you, how, just, just thinking about where we're at with the climate emergency as a city, just how can we be as robust as possible? Yeah, of course. So the supplementary planning gu guidance, it is guidance, um, but that is where the starting point is, and that is what is being referred to in the, in the um, consultation response from highways and that in regards to the cycling parking. So that would be their starting point. Um, I can't see a reason why, um, uh, the, why we would agree anything less than what is in there, even though this is going above in terms of biodiversity net gain and the current sustainability. Um, we are in a climate emergency, which in the planning balance is one of the reasons why we think um, this application could potentially be approved um, so we wouldn't be looking to kind of compromise on that um, anywhere less. Uh, members just to pick up on two points that have been raised as discussed previously this is a departure from um, local policy it's not the first time this committee has dealt with that actually quite recently we dealt with another departure um, but that's why this is here uh, and we're having that debate so uh, it's important that this is discussed, hence we had the site visit. Um, Councillor Smith, you've raised valid points in terms of the scope. So whilst there's a minimum requirement, you may want to think about, well, let's not lose sight of the scope um, in that regard. I don't wish to influence your, your thoughts, but um, don't lose sight of that. This is a very important uh, development. Uh, and if there's scope, we should explore that, particularly anything that's going to affect the climate. Uh, adjacent to the residential area. Next on my list is Councillor Tippett's. And members, please feel free to come back in if you have other questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, going back to the housing, um, it notes that this uh, site was first designated for housing in March 2019, uh, which was three and a half years ago. Um, and I completely appreciate that COVID would have scuppered uh, some opportunities to uh, put in work on housing, um, but how much work has actually gone into source a suitable developer for this land for housing, and how much work has been put in to see whether this land would be suitable as a council development for social housing? Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Tippett. And again, I might call on Jonathan to help support um, my answer. Um, but I know when the Joint Local Plan um, was being adopted and being consulted on, um, we did actually approach the then landowner to potentially buy the site um, to actually try and deliver housing on this. Um, but there was no interest, and instead the landowner actually objected um, to the um, allocation in the Joint Local Plan originally. Um, so whilst... Um, so whilst the inspectors found that sound, they obviously would have seen the representation, seen the evidence from the joint local plan, and they didn't remove the site from housing, so it was allocated. Um, there was some work previously um, to kind of potentially buy the site and try to deliver housing on there, and there hasn't been interest. Um, and annually, uh, we contact um, the developers um, uh, in the, um, on the allocated sites in the housing trajectory, and again, um, annually, we haven't received um, anything further um, from uh, the landowner um, with regards to interest and to delivering this site as housing. Um, Jonathan, do you have anything to add? No? Okay. Councillor Tippins, do you want to come back on that point, or are you content with the response? Um, just to, so I understand it, uh, so um, when you say you're contacting annually, is that just the landowner or it, does the land go out to tender uh, to other housing developers and the opportunity for other people to buy the land for housing? Uh, sorry if that sounds like a stupid question, it's my first time on the committee. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, so we're not, we're not the, the landowner, and in terms of uh, um, how that process works, um, in terms of going out for tender, um, I'm unsure on, on that side of it. Perhaps um, Jonathan may be able to help with that. But basically, as part of our um, annual um, reporting schedule, um, we do contact um, each um, uh, site is allocated to a case officer, um, and every year we contact the landowners to see whether um, there's been an update on the delivery of the site, whether there's any interest in the site coming forward, whether there's anything we can do to unlock that. So that's um, just an annual basis that case officers do. Um, and basically, since we've um, been contacting them, um, we haven't had um, any interest come forward. 
Um, just to assist the debate, Councillor Tippett, perhaps uh, Ms Jackman, Head of Legal Services, could assist at this point. Thank you, Councillor Darcy. Um, the land isn't in the Council's ownership, therefore the Council has um, no control over how the land might come forward whilst it's not within its ownership. We couldn't run an exercise to see whether anybody was interested. It's solely at the discretion of the landowner. Whilst it remains in their control and their ownership, it's theirs to try and forge the way forward in terms of development, and this is the proposals that they've come forward with. Thank you so much for helping clarify that. It makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Watkins. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's an obvious economic benefit from this uh, derelict site, um, but the, whole, the, the benefit will only occur when the whole of the site is developed. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, I understand there's no builder's merchant actually arranged to go in there yet, um, and what the situation will be with the ESP if there's no, uh, nobody uh, in the other building. Um, so at the moment, um, that's correct. So the unit A, um, which is the unit to be remodelled, is uh, for home bargains. Um, unit uh, C is to be um, the builder's merchant. Um, there is an, uh, whilst um, I've been told by the applicant there is interest in the site, um, there is no um, end occupier at the moment. Um, so the assumptions would have been made on the floor space, which is being um, put forward as a builder's merchant. Um, but yeah, that's, there's, no, um, there's no confirmed uh, thing. So, but the majority of the jobs, I would assume, would come from the home bargains. Um, but yeah, whilst, um, whilst there's no end occupier, um, the calculations would have been made on the floor space. Thank you. Councillor Riley. So I'm, I'm not very... Um, clued up on planning, but I am clued up on, on homelessness. <laughs> it's my day job. So I just wanted to ask two questions. Um, what is a healthy supply of housing or housing land? And also, what is the time scale to remove a space that's allocated for housing before you say it's too tricky and we're going to allow someone else to go in there? Um, also, I'd like to say that I have also opposed housing in a very small place so I just wanted to you know we do need appropriate spaces and this looks like an appropriate space does it not um, yeah thank you councillor Riley um, so again I might call on Jonathan to see if there's anything to help answer um, but what constitutes a healthy supply of housing is um, basically for the joint local plan there's a plethora of evidence base that is needed um, and housing needs for the city are um, calculated and then the supply needs to be put forward and the council needs to put forward a five-year housing land supply um, which is five years of housing to housing sites um, to build to meet the needs of housing and in the city. Um, with regards to how, um, whether a site is too tricky to be delivered as housing or should be something else, um, there is no set time scale um, of kind of when that is. Um, this is a finely balanced decision and each um, site needs to be taken on its own merits. Um, it, is a, it is a loss um, to the housing um, numbers um, to lose this site as housing, um, but officers do feel overall um, that there, is, there isn't any interest um, for housing on this site. Um, and uh, with the economic benefits and the climate emergency, um, we're, because we have this application in front of us on balance, we think it's okay um, to recommend it for approval at the moment. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, on that last point, I, I'll probably just emphasise that the, the officer recommendation isn't on the basis that we don't think this site could be brought forward for housing because we still do, and that's, that's what the local plan is proposing. It's more on the application before you. You have to make a judgment as to whether there are any other material considerations that outweigh the local plan policy. And uh, as, as Jessica said, we think that is a very finely ba balanced judgment, and it's absolutely right and proper, therefore, that you have this debate to see whether the scales of the benefits of this proposal outweigh what we would lose um, 
but we're certainly not saying that we don't think this site is a suitable site in the long term for housing. That's not what the recommendation is saying. It's more that assessment of the scales between the weight of the other material considerations against what the local plan is actually saying. And we think there is a case to say that those scales have just tipped in favour of um, going against the local plan. But that's clearly a judgment that, that you have to make. Um, in terms of the actual housing numbers, I mean, the plan itself uh, uh, seeks 26,700 net additional dwellings in the plan period, uh, in the period to 2034. Uh, and we are, as a, as, an author as a plan area, we are quite significantly ahead of that in terms of our delivery at the moment, which is why we think you've got some wriggle room, really, in, in making a decision on whether a site uh, can maybe be let go that is of 60 houses in the plan period. I'm, I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I have Councillor Stevens. Thanks. Um, can we go back to paragraph 129, which is where we left off when I was last, uh, um, last speaking? The traffic movements. Um, the transport statement provided, as, as, as it says in the paragraph, says that the current proposal, if, if implemented, would see a decrease in traffic journeys of the three numbers there at the times related to them. What's that a decrease from? So uh, on weekday mornings, there would be 352 fewer car journeys, fewer than what? Um, apologies, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I can quickly um, look well, at them. It's paragraph 12129. Yeah, so it says there's a decrease in the traffic attraction of approximately 352, 67, mm. and 566, and the weekly. Yeah, so got that. What's that a decrease? What, is it, is which it, scenario would see 352 more car journeys than this scheme? What's this in comparison to? Um, so this is in comparison to if the three units are to remain as retail. So if <coughs> the three units mm -hmm. are to remain and operate as retail mm -hmm. um, and without the reduction of the retail floor mm -hmm. space, um, then we would expect um, that the, three, you, the mm -hmm. 352, 67, 566 um, is a decrease of if the three units mm -hmm. were being um, used as a retail, which it currently has planning mm -hmm. permission for. But we don't know the we've already established we don't know what the similar journeys would be for a developed housing scheme as laid out in the joint local plan um no we okay. currently don't know that's that's fine you see i i think see where i where, tell you where i am i think the how the joint local plan is worth worth defending and, and defending it a, uh, more robustly than, than we're looking at today um i know great economic or housing expert, but I could have told you that things slow down when we have a global pandemic and high inflation. That doesn't come as any great surprise to this economic amateur. What we do with the whole point of the, the joint local plan is it's a long-term plan. It's not short-term response to what happened last week. COVID will eventually pass in all its forms. The economy will get back on track in whatever form that looks like this site will become a lot more viable for housing than it is now. That's what ha that's what that's what ha what's happened in the development of our city for for decades. We go through peaks and troughs, and we when we when we around this table put on other hats, we argue the politics of that. Here we look at the long term planning implications for the city, and the suitability for housing on this site for me is as strong as it was the day we agreed the joint local plan. Other people might disagree, but I think it's worth, um, worth defending. So at the moment, my view is, or personally, I'll be voting against for the reason that it's a departure from the local plan, and that's what we should maintain at the moment. Well, I'm grateful for that very early indication. We still have a number of speakers to get through, so perhaps you will allow them to get involved in the debate, and uh, we'll get to that point in due course. Councillor um, Stoneman. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
it's, this is back on the application of the joint local plan for a minute. Um, it's to do with parking. Now, the first point is building on what Councillor Smith said. I am very, very keen to see if we can put a, a, a number or a percentage in as a condition because I'm quite concerned uh, for electric charging that it could be, and you know, I, I do trust what you say, but I am concerned that that might not come to fruition, the, the amount might not be the number that's deemed acceptable. So I would like to see if there's something that we can do as a condition as to whether we can put that in the application. And the second point is, I just want to clarify if I heard the number right a minute ago. Um, there are 177 car parking spaces that have been allocated or proposed. And did you say there were 20 um, wide spaces for disabled and parent and carer going in? And if so, is that a normal amount? Because it seems rather a small number for the size of the car park. Um, so the Highways Authority haven't um, objected to that number. Um, so they've deemed that that is acceptable um, for, where, for where it is. Um, so we haven't um, pushed um, the applicant on that point um, as, as, not, as the concern hasn't been raised. Um, but I would, I would assume that that would be without what our standards are. Okay, um, you've indicated that you may be considering a condition. I just remind you on that point. Uh, Councillor Tippins. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Chair. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> right, now that was my fault because I, I, I mashed the two names together. I thought, what I'd like to say at this point, we, we won't invite you, we've heard enough for the moment, um, but um, I'm going to offer that to uh, Councillor Tuffin because we haven't heard from you yet, even though you're not here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a bit of advice, really, because um, as we say, we're departing from the local plan. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether we're setting a precedent that at some point in the future, this will come down as a point of appeal at another plan application. So I have some doubts about departing from the local plan because, as we all recognise how much work was put in to create it, it's, it's a real concern. So um, perhaps some legal advice on whether we are setting any type of precedent. Thank you, Chair. Um, essentially, no. Departure from the local plan is the exception rather than the rule. And to depart from the local plan, you've got to have the weight in favour of doing so. So the fact that a particular application has been considered and when you've considered the planning balance and the material planning considerations, that has led the committee to decide, for example, the team would depart from the plan. It doesn't put you in any position in terms of um, precedent for any additional applications because you'll need to assess each application on its merits. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, um, I, I realise we always, uh, we always uh, look at every application as an individual application as a, as a committee, but I just, I just thought it was important that we made that point. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I just um, want to go back to this point that we've mentioned a few times about what would, what could be there if this isn't happening, because I think we're slightly, you know, assuming that if this isn't what happens, it's going to become 60 houses. And from what I'm hearing, we have got the option that it could be three retail units that would also technically be a departure from the local plan, because we don't have it allocated for general retail, we've allocated it for specific retail if we go with today's point. So I'm just interested to just understand that because, again, a lot of, I absolutely hear what everyone's saying, but we're sort of, I think, in danger of hypothesising about what might happen. And I just want to double check that there is that scope that if we don't go with this and housing doesn't come forward, that we might still be back here as a committee discussing another departure from the local plan on the same site, but for a different aspect. Does that make sense? It does to me. Yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, so thanks, Councillor Smith. Um, so basically, when I'm referring to the three retail units, I'm talking about what the site is currently has planning permission for and what the site could come forward as under its permitted development, development rights. So at the moment, on the site, there is um, 6,000 square metres of open retail use. Um, so, uh, so any retailer at the moment could go in there and occupy those buildings as retail. Um, if uh, another application came in for a retail 
say just to re just to refurbish, for example, um, those units, um, then again potentially that would need to come to committee again because again that would be a departure. Um, but under permitted development rights, if they don't need to apply for planning permission, um, which they don't need for the use, um, and they might not need to for some of the refurbishment, um, then yes, technically the site could stay and remain as as retail. Um, even if the application is refused today. Um, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Tippetts. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, considering we are departing from the local plan, I think we have got an opportunity here as the planning committee to, um, yeah, as being presented, uh, provide new economic uh, prosperity in the city, um, but also uh, strengthen climate change commitments uh, at the same time. Uh, so my first question on that is uh, condition number two, a commencement within three years. Um, I was just wondering whether that is a, a legal thing, if it has to be three years uh, with section 51 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act of 2004, or is this something that we can set ourselves? Because if we're looking for short-term economic gain, um, as one of the reasons we're departing from the joint local plan, commencing within three years seems like quite a long time to be waiting to get that economic uh, prosperity started. Thanks, Councillor Tippett. Um, from my understanding, that is a standard condition which goes on to um, all planning applications, so to commence within three years. Um, as you heard um, from the agent, um, they, the um, uh, exchange of this site is on the condition that this is um, uh, um, given planning permission pretty quickly. Um, I know um, there's been quite a few extension of times on this application to kind of get it to the position where it is now. And I know um, there is, um, there is um, a sense of uh, um, urgency from the applicant to want to kind of move forward with this site. Um, so it is a standing condition um, for three years. Um, I don't think we'd usually expect them to reduce that. Um, but from what, um, from what we're hearing from the um, applicant and the agent as you hear today is that hopefully this site would commence um, pretty quickly. Ms Jackman, would you like to come in on the legalities involved in the three-year um, beginning commencement date, please? Absolutely. Um, I'd support what the officers just said. It is a standard condition. In terms of reducing that, um, what I would add, though strictly not legal, position is that um, at the moment obviously construction, the construction industry is facing delays in terms of resourcing things etc. So any additional pressure in terms of commencement may not necessarily be achievable but as the planning officer has explained there obviously is an intended user of the end unit A um, so I can't imagine that it's necessarily going to be a slow development in terms of coming forward. Thank you. Are you content with that response? Yes, th thank you. Um, my second question is a different topic, so shall I wait and then join the back of the queue? No, you have the floor. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's uh, going on back to uh, condition number eight with the points that Councillor Smith was raising on the electric vehicle charging points. Is, uh, for me, looking at the, um, Bennett, uh, the opportunity we have here, uh, whilst well deviating from the joint local plan to strengthen other parts, uh, particularly um, with the climate emergency, um, is this, uh, in terms of the uh, provision of electric vehicle charging points, I'm afraid it's another legal ease question, as I'm not familiar with all of the acts. Um, is there a set number that we have to put into conditions, or is that something that, um, that that's, that's here now, or is it something that can be uh, strengthened? So just to understand how the uh, uh, number suggested numbers here came to be in this condition? Um, yeah, of course. So the uh, condition at the moment doesn't specify the numbers in terms of EV charging and cycle provision, um, but we've asked for adequate provision of that. Um, so our standard um, for this is set out in the um, supplementary planning document, um, which is a guidance document um, on how the policies um, should be implemented. Um, so that's kind of where the starting point would be. And um, I believe um, for retail, it's based on floor space um, and the amount of visitors um, expected. Um, so the calculation of how much EV charging and cabling that would need to be provided um, would kind of be set out based on the amount of floor space and that's expected to be provided by the development. 
and thus where our highways authority would start as the as what and what they would expect. It's all good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have Councillor Stevens to come in uh, as chair. I'd like to raise a couple of queries if I can. I'll obviously yield to Councillor Stevens. Um, are there any other members wishing to speak? I appreciate we've been going for almost an hour, but this is, it is right that we um, debate this matter. It's um, a departure from plan and it's a big development. So in the absence of any hands, Councillor Stevens, and, and then if I can raise a few queries, uh, that'll be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, there's no obligation for us to depart from the local plan. The language seems to be we are doing that. That's the choice we have. And maintaining and defending the local plan is as open to us as departing from it. So I'm worried that there's this sort of sense of inevitability. People will come to their own, con own conclusion of the vote. Of course they will. But maintaining and defending the, um, the local plan and its housing, housing supply is, is just as... Uh, uh, open to us as any other course of action and we've heard from from the officer that this site is still suitable I don't want to put words in the officer's mouth but I think you said su still suitable for housing um, I'm just a bit worried about Rebecca's comment about hypothesizing although we've only got one we don't have a choice between a retail and a housing scheme today that's not how it works we've only got one scheme to judge the merits of we do hypothesize all the time that's what Planning, that's what planning, policy-led planning is. We have looked at this, we're not looking at this site in the abstract and saying what would be suitable. Oh, retail, that, that's not how it works. We've looked at it in detail and we actually, we heard from the officers, there was a debate at adoption, at the adoption point about whether or not housing was suitable so it's well, this doesn't seem like it was sort of rushed through or glossed over or or, or nodded past the inspector we've hypothesized and the lo lo joint local plan which isn't exactly a small document as our officers will tell you in terms of uh, uh, getting it all uh, all printed or, or online has hypothesized that it's most suitable for housing and all other options certainly in terms of what we're looking at today were considered clearly people have as always got to judge it on their on their merits but i'll i, I sense you're coming to the end of the debate and it's been a very good debate and i think uh, one that uh, a lot of people have contributed a lot of uh, um positivity to um, in fairness I to think councillor stevens mm -hmm. if i may interject yes, of course. um if there's any summing up to do we'll do that at the end of the yeah. debate i thought you had a question no um, i'm giving a comment chair as, okay. as, as, as well, this as this we, portion of the meeting is, we've is certainly formed. i have questions to to ask okay. the officer um but we certainly got mm. your point about the yeah. departure from policy mm. it's not inevitable yeah. and the hypothesis mm. and, and not but it's not but it's where i dis where, where i disagree with the officers is that I don't think it is finally balanced. And that's been noted, yeah. yeah. Well, 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 I'd like other people might not note it as quickly as you, and I'd like to finish my point, well, if I may, Chair. Well, if you would, I, thanks. Thank you. It's not as finely balanced for me as it might be for the officers, and that's not a, a professional criticism at all. I think the allocation was robust, it's defensible, and in terms of the scheme that's before us today, that's what we should do. I'm, I'm grateful for your clarification. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a point of clarification for members, really. Um, obviously, the site is allocated in the local plan, and it does have that allocation. What you do need to keep in mind and stress is that doesn't mean it will come forward for housing. Um, I believe that's where Councillor Smith was getting to earlier. So you have an application in front of you which is not in relation to housing and um, regardless of what you determine in relation to the application doesn't necessarily guarantee that throughout the life plan period the period the life of the plan that this will still come forward for housing because i go back to the response i gave to councillor tippett which is that it is not within the control of the council in order to bring this forward for delivery um i'm not expressing any view either way in terms of the validity of the application but i just do feel that that's important for you all to keep in mind in terms of the actual effect of the allocation I'm grateful, thank you. Um, may I just um, seek some clarifications, please? If, um, is it possible 
paragraphs, or rather conditions, 6, 8, and 16. They deal with the code of practice, um, further details, and condition uh, regarding site management. Is it possible, if, if I was to put an amendment in, and, and that was duly seconded, that um, that could be discharged, those three, uh, in consultation with um, ward councillors? Uh, there are two, uh, whilst this sits in the Plimpton Earl Ward, it, it abuts, runs parallel to the Plimpton St Mary's Ward, uh, of which I am a councillor. Um, but is it possible to have those conditions discharged in consultation with Plimpton Earl and Plimpton St Mary councillors because they deal with a lot of matters that have not been clarified at this stage? Um, is that a possible, I have a few questions, but is that possible if that amendment was put forward and seconded? Um, yes, I believe that is possible. I'd be happy to second that, Chair. It doesn't affect my view of the overall scheme, but if it has to go through, then I'm happy to have it in that form. Um, I have a few questions, but I, I see Councillor Smith wants to come in also. So I think that's a really sensible way forward, and I, like Councillor Stevens, would support it. I wonder, though, given the... Con particularly given the debate we've had around sustainability and the climate emergency, whether we add in, and I realise you wear both hats, but whether we add in chair and deputy chair or whatever, which is often what we do when we're discharging duties, so rather than just to ward councillors, yeah, chairs and vice chair, or whoever we think, but more than just the ward councillors, but somebody who's got that look at the planning aspect of it as well, if you understand my game. I, I'm grateful that you think I have an understanding of the aspect, but yes, uh, absolutely, um, Chair and Vice Chair, I'm grateful, thank you. And, and um, I'll duly put that amendment to the floor and note that Council Stevens. We Stevens's are including second. opposition lead when we talk about Chair. If we're extending it beyond the local councillors, it is yeah. customary to have the Chair, Vice Chair and opposition lead as the consultees in that format. Yep. Um, uh, that's grateful, thank you. Um, can I, uh, so that's 6, 8 and 16. Can I um, invite you to uh, condition 22, please? Um, delivery hours, and we'll come to 23 um, shortly. Um, the Monday to Saturday, 7 till 2200 hours. It's, um, in my view, a little late, uh, considering um, the residential properties immediately opposite. At some parts of the site, particularly the most eastern part of the site, they're quite close, probably 100 yards. Um, if if um, uh, that can be, a, a proposal can be put forward and amended to an earlier time if there's a seconder, um, and, and I'm mooting at this stage probably uh, a delivery time of 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., uh, and I see you nodding to say that if an amendment is put that can be uh, considered and conditioned? Um, yes, I believe so. Um, but uh, just so you're aware, um, we did check um, the adjacent Lidl's, and the Lidl's delivery time is 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I can imagine we can amend the condition, but the Lidl's next door um, does um, actually allow earlier delivery and a longer period of time. Sorry, that's very helpful, thank you. May I make an inquiry about um, condition 23, the hours of operation? Um, again, considering 11 p.m., 2300 hours is quite late um, and would advance that 10 o'clock might be um, more tolerable for the residents uh, opposite. I'm interested to uh, make that comparison with Lidl, as you've uh, discussed in the previous condition. Um, again, any thoughts on that at this stage? Um, yeah, so that one is different to the Lidl. So the Lidl opening um, hours, the original condition was 8 a.m. to um, 9 p.m. Um, so, yeah, um, we, can amend, we can amend the um, hours, um, but that would, uh, it means the home bargains would have an hour on Lidl um, for 10 p.m. But, yeah, I take the point on the amenity and the closeness to the residential areas. Thank you. I appreciate I'm hogging the floor, but I have um, allowed the debate for an hour, so I'm, I'm getting my turn. Um, um, could I um, uh, ask you to put up slide 13, please? I think that's the one that illustrated it best. Uh, 
trigger happy. There we are. Um, so as I see it, um, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a gap. It's the most easterly part of the site, I think, in terms of the tree lines, the trees that are protected. Um, you'll see there's a gap of about 20 metres. I don't think it's, it's somewhere between 10 and 20 metres. Um, I, I don't have a pointy thing. Um, but on the right-hand side of the screen, could you wiggle your cursor over that? So I do have the cursor on there, but it, for some reason it's not showing. Um, okay. But I believe it's um, yeah. uh, is the um, place you're referring to, um, the um, to the right hand side of the green blob. Yeah, so um, unit, which C, ends. unit C car park. Yeah. Where the trees so the end. North. Um, yeah. That's um, so opposite is uh, Plymouth Road residence. Uh, it, it's actually a 10 to 20 meter gap, and if vehicles are coming in and out there, particularly delivery vehicles. Could it be conditioned that there is tree planting to go into that 20 meter gap um, to help prevent any headlight or light uh, nuisance or disturbance for those residents across the road? Uh, and equally, so on that point alone. Um, yes, we would be able to add a condition asking um, the uh, developer to provide further details on landscaping in that area. Great. And just staying with that slide, it, it's slightly out of view. So the uh, the far right single blob, just below it, um, there's a gate, as we saw on the site yesterday, which I believe the behind that gate is, is still part of the um, uh, landowner's um, site. And again, um, I would be seeking a condition that there was some planting that goes in there to help screen it also. Again, it's only probably five metres, six metres in width. Um, yeah, I don't think that would be a problem. I'll just pop up the proposed um, site. So it's the triangle of land um, that you're referring to, to the right-hand side. Um, yeah. Um, I'm hoping you're catching all these um, uh, amendments as we go along. Um, so, I'm hoping um, Carly is. <laughs> so to um, confirm, I, I proposed an amendment, Councillor Stevens second uh, on that. Uh, consultation with our discharge consultation with um, uh, ward councillors, chair, uh, vice chair, and, and, and um, uh, opposition chair and vice chair. In respect of that, um, that needs to put to be put. Um, forgive me, I've, I've lost my train of thought. We need to we need to vote on that. Yes, we need to vote. Thank you. Super, and then the other conditions, I'm looking for a seconder in respect of the tree coverage. I note that Councillor Smith has raised a hand in respect of those other conditions. And then the timeliness of the um, opening hours. I'll yield on the delivery point, but the timeliness of the opening hours, I know Councillor Watkins is uh, seconding that amendment. Thank you. Um, I think that's the end of my points. So I turn back to the committee to see if there's any other hands. Councillor Stoneman. Thank you, Chair. I would like to um, add a condition. What the electric charging points? Ignore me. All right, thank you, members. I see no more hands up for questions. Um, I'm very grateful. This is, a, you know, when you look at the agenda, you see one item, and they were hedging bets. Some members had the temerity to say, well, this will be rather brief. Um, it's important that it's not brief. This is a departure from policy, as has been raised many times. It's a substantial development, um, and um, hence the need for a site visit. And I, and I think we've had a very good debate um, today in respect of that. Very much take on board the, the comments from Mr. Bell and the officer. It is a very finely balanced application and we have cognizance of the jobs, the uh, economic benefits, the uh, state of the site as it is currently, the, the housing need, the housing uh, stock uh, supply. Uh, and I think it's been very helpful to have that really healthy discussion on that. Um, members, you're about to be asked to um, vote in response to the officer's recommendation subject to those amendments that have been uh, suggested and seconded uh, in respect of that. You will note the officer's 
Um, recommendation is to grant conditionally. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Francis, if you would. Okay, yes, so just to confirm, uh, the uh, additions suggested will be additional conditions to agree tree planting details in the gap on the boundary by the end unit and in the triangular area of land at the end of the site. And for um, condition 23, the hours of operation, the unit A hours to be amended to 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock. That's correct, yeah, an hour reduced, yeah. And then amendments to conditions 6, 8 and 16, so that they're in consultation with ward members from Plimpton St. Mary, Plimpton St. Earl, Chair, Vice Chair and Opposition Lead. I think that was everything. That's all I have. Yeah. Thank you very much, members. If you would vote in due course when it pops up on your um, device. Thank you, members. Uh, as illustrated on the screen, that has been passed. Um, we thank you very much, uh, Jess. We shall move on to the next item on the agenda, which is planning enforcement. That's pages 41 to 42 of your bundle. And I ask the committee to note. Uh, Councillor Stevens. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, um, figures are what they are, and thanks to. Uh, um, colleagues for the, the continual work as, as, as we always but uh, genuinely say not for uh, an answer now for obvious reasons but could Carly or colleagues let us know who is currently uh, dealing with the enforcement matters on the, in the department so we know who to go Cle clearly the uh, everyone's watching at home so I'm not sure it's something that you would want to uh, advertise to the world uh, but if you can let councillors know in terms of who we need to contact if issues come up in our wards, that would be extremely helpful. Please. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Um, okay, uh, noted. Um, agenda item eight, planning applications issued. Um, pages 43 to 70. Um, I invite you to note those. Any queries arising? No? Thank you. Uh, and uh, item number, five, uh, number nine, the appeal decisions, 71 to 74. Uh, members, you will note there were three, I think, accounted. One, two, three, four. Is it? One, two, three, four. Um, very successful outcomes in respect of those. Any comments, Carly, in respect of those appeals? No, no comments. Thanks, Chair. Any questions from members in respect to those appeals? Noted, thank you. Um, members, thank you very much. That takes us to the end of the agenda. Thank you very much to the debate, and particularly um, from new members. Um, you, you held the floor for some time. Well done. Um, you kept Councillor Stevens quiet for part of the meeting, which is always welcome. <laughs> just, um, just, thank ju you very much. Just for members. your memory, summing up from this position is called doing a Nicholson. Well, <laughs> I shan't comment. Thank you. Have which a very is, good evening. <laughs>